The global pandemic, COVID-19, poses an unprecedented challenge. The work of our resilience practitioners is more important now than ever. I'm Chloe Domrovsky, President and CEO of DRI International. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this special webinar as a part of our dedicated pandemic resource series to help you better respond to and recover from the coronavirus crisis. Joining us today for a presentation and discussion on COVID-19 and what it means for businesses is Dr. Megan Coffey. Dr. Coffey is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at NYU Langone, reporting live to you from New York City. We are grateful to her for taking the time to offer her valuable perspective on the current state of the COVID-19 response. Dr. Coffey, thank you for being with us today. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you're able to hear me well. Uh, my name is Megan Coffey. I am an infectious disease doctor. And most of my career, I have spent it uh, either traveling to epidemics or uh, trying to model epidemics that are far from me. Uh, and I'm suddenly finding myself in that other position of having the epidemic uh, come to me. Uh, so I am a doctor in New York City uh, right now. Uh, so you may even hear uh, the sound of ambulances um, through the window. Uh, it's been a very different experience here over the last uh, 10 days or so in New York City. Uh, so I'm going to uh, try to give an introduction um, to some of the questions in COVID, the things that I think have continued to come up um, as issues. Um, but please feel free to uh, ask any questions and hopefully at the end or um, as a blog post, I can try to answer some of those. Um, so uh, I wanna say the first thing first is that whatever seems like too much today will seem like too little tomorrow. Uh, this has been a huge problem in this outbreak is that it's just incredibly hard to wrap our heads around something that is this enormous and also at this point invisible yet present at the same time. Uh, I've worked in a number of epidemics. I've worked on Ebola in West Africa. I've worked on um, Lhasa uh, where there was Boko Haram. I've worked on cholera in Haiti. There's a sense of denial uh, that always is present uh, in any epidemic response. Just trying to imagine the scale of what will happen uh, can definitely change our ability uh, to respond. So uh, just to put us where we are today, uh, I think most of us have heard this, but the US now has more reported cases, more confirmed cases than any other country in the world. Uh, and the worrisome thing is we're still growing. Um, unlike other countries that have started to uh, plateau off, uh, this is still a growth uh, for the US and we are a very large country with many cities and many micro epidemics. Uh, so this will be a complicated picture. Uh, right now, New York, as I said, is our epicenter in the US. Uh, it also is the uh, blue here. Um, it is actually the uh, fastest doubling number of deaths uh, in any uh, city or region. Uh, this is compared to um, Italy and uh, Milan, Madrid, uh, Barcelona. What's been happening in New York State, which is predominantly New York City, uh, has just been at such a, a fast rate. Um, this doesn't mean that uh, we will not be seeing this elsewhere, unfortunately. Uh, these are the outbreaks right now that we're looking at in other parts of the US. Uh, as you can see, New York is by far ahead, but the doubling rate in Michigan is actually um, a bit faster uh, in terms of death rates. We'll probably see this in New Jersey, in Florida, in Georgia. Um, anytime that there is large mass gatherings, mixings, of people, there can often be uh, more growth afterwards. Uh, so there's been a lot of concern that there'll be uh, multiple epidemics in Florida. Uh, unfortunately, Milan had a similar um, 
kind of mass event. They had a, a large football match or soccer match uh, with a lot of uh, participants, a lot of fans coming in. Um, and that probably led to a lot of the mingling and the seeding of the epidemic that really took uh, Italy by surprise. And um, just to give the whole kind of picture of the world, obviously the US um, is now uh, the has the most cases uh, countrywide uh, reported. And you can see that Europe though is still um, quite an epicenter of infections. There will be outbreaks in South America. There will be outbreaks in Africa that will continue to grow. Uh, there's also going to be the issues that the world is distracted. Uh, there's going to be supply chain issues for these later epidemics, uh, which will then continue to be a risk for seeding back to the primary epidemics. Uh, I think you probably have noticed that China had reported that it's uh, limiting travel of foreigners into the country to avoid reseeding the epidemic. Uh, this will be a concern in many countries. I'd also say if you look at the map, you can kind of notice that some countries uh, are just not readily reporting cases. That will continue to be an issue where sometimes the gray places on the map, uh, places where you must have infections, like Myanmar, uh, right on the border of China, uh, where all of its surrounding countries uh, have had large epidemics, uh, likewise to Central Asia. Um, there's often a sense of not reporting. If you don't look for it, you don't find it, uh, you don't report it. And then uh, as we saw in Wuhan, it can please your superiors, but eventually it leads to a much bigger epidemic if it's not reported and tackled. Uh, so we may be seeing some of the gray areas in the map that have the smaller outbreaks right now as bigger issues uh, in the future. And just um, to stress, New York City is having an outbreak that is going to be on the same order of magnitude as some of these cities that are now associated with coronavirus, um, like Wuhan, uh, like Qom Iran, like Milan, like Madrid. Um, and this will be um, something staggering for uh, to be able to handle. Um, yesterday, there were more 911 calls than New York City has ever had. Uh, this uh, was more than 9-11, and it was really palpable. Um, all night, there were, uh, all night there were uh, uh, different fire ambulances um, driving through the city. Um, I'm right next to an old person's home uh, where every morning there's now an ambulance to pick up patients. Um, and I work in Bellevue Hospital uh, in New York City. So we can say very much that it's a very palpable real epidemic here. So I just wanna go over some of the basics. Uh, first things first, uh, the incubation period after being exposed, it's usually about five days. It can be about two to 14 days. Uh, we don't expect it to be more than 14. And if it is more than 14, we actually expect that there was a second exposure. And then a large number will go on and have no symptoms. Uh, they may, though, have positive virus that they can shed and infect other people with, which we'll get to. Uh, then other people, for the first five to eight days of having symptoms, they may have fever, cough, that's most common. Some may first have diarrhea before the fever and cough. Some will have muscle aches, fatigue, and some will have simply just a lack of smell, uh, which is probably one of the most uh, one of the strongest hallmarks of this disease uh, in that there's a lot of viruses that can cause fever or cough, but very few that just cause a lack of smell without a runny nose, without any sinus congestion. And then after five to eight days, um, and sometimes up to 10 days, you, you either do fine or you don't. Uh, you usually develop at this kind of eight day mark uh, fever, cough, shortness of breath, and those are the people who become severe. Um, usually about 82% of patients are mild uh, illness. It's a, you can't exactly say the number because we never know exactly who the denominator is. Uh, no country has been able to test everybody uh, to be able to identify every single infection. And then in addition to the 82% mild, it's probably about 15% are severe. And then uh, three percent are critical, um, and so the fifteen percent are severe. Are people who, without an incredible amount of resources, uh, are people that we can ensure that they survive. The eighty-two percent are mild, could avoid a hospital, avoid hospital, 
any kind of medical care and do well. The 15% who are severe, they would need um, oxygen, basic care. Uh, the 3% are critical. That's the people who use up the ICU beds. And that's become kind of the common good that we're looking at in medicine because we just do not have uh, the ICU beds to be able to deal with a surge of this number of critical care patients. Even though it might seem like a small number, if we're having a large percent of the population infected, it actually becomes a great excess to what we actually have. Um, and so just to also bring up these atypical presentations, this leads to a lot of the transmission, particularly in hospitals, which often become the kind of uh, the nidus, the, the node of infection in these outbreaks. Uh, people who come with abdominal pain, they look like they have appendicitis, they get an abdominal scan to look for the appendicitis. And then on that, they find the findings of uh, what we call ground glass opacities, but just the findings in their lungs that are consistent with this disease and nothing else was going on in their abdomen. Others will have headache, uh, cough, um, or they might have no cough at all. Some just have fatigue, no fever. Um, and then this no sense of taste or smell is kind of interesting. There's actually a receptor that uh, the coronavirus uses that it attaches to in the lungs, but it can also attach in the olfactory bulb, which also can lead to a possible um, encephalitis or passing uh, to the brain. Um, and the fatality rate, if everything goes well and surge capacity is not stressed, we could easily have a fatality rate of less than 1% if we identify all the cases, have a good denominator. Um, but when there's surge capacity issues, uh, we can find ourselves with a much higher fatality rate. Uh, and then just to give a projection based on what the past has been, obviously this will be better than 1918 is our hope, but it can be, depending on how many people become infected, this can be a tremendous burden. Um, and just to talk a little bit about transmissibility of this disease, uh, for the most part, it's spread by droplets, uh, which are five micron or larger little uh, droplets in the air that just fall to the ground. And they fall within one meter, three feet. Uh, we usually give people six feet of room so that we avoid actually getting these uh, droplets inhaled by us. But usually by the point at which we're at like four feet, they're at the ground. By three feet, they're at our feet. Uh, so that's usually okay. There are uh, airborne uh, transmission events with this virus, but usually that's after an aerosolization um, uh, procedure. Um, so usually that's after we've intubated someone or done something else that's manipulated their airway. Um, in terms of the uh, R0, probably you've heard of this, this is the number of infections secondarily after a first infection. So if one person came to an island where this infection has never been, uh, if the R0 is two, you would have two people who would be uh, infected with this. And then those two people would infect two more and then so on and so on. If you have your R0 less than one, meaning each person does not infect one person uh, on average, they affect less than one person, then you have the outbreak die out. And that's our, that's our goal. Uh, comparing this um, for coronavirus, it's around two to three, uh, but Ebola it was two, measles it's 18, untreated TB it's 10. Um, and this is a number that can change not to throw a lot of equations in, but just to explain the number of contacts you have times the amount of duration you have of those contacts times the transmission per contact. Um, so if you have uh, a chance of 10% of transmission per contact, you have 10 contacts while you're infectious and then you're infectious for 10 days, uh, you, can, you can see that it could actually change if you were to isolate yourself and not have any contacts, if you were to um, have a very low rate of contacts, all these efforts to isolate people. Um, and then to reduce transmission is uh, all of the efforts with masks and gloves in hospitals, uh, and hopefully at some point treatment can reduce that. Um, but just to point out, 
the amount of transmission you have in an outbreak can vary greatly. And we're at that point right now where we're having a really high number, like Italy had back in early February, where they were seeing uh, basically eight or more patients infected per each one patient. And that becomes incredibly hard to handle. But it's not, it's not all pessimism. You can see that Japan, South Korea, and Singapore have been able to get their numbers down to less than one, that's the dotted line. Um, so it, it definitely is possible. But I'd also say one other thing is that uh, transmission happens in networks. So it's the person who's the people person who's going to get infected first. And those are the people who got infected first in New York. I can say as a doctor, uh, the people I was called about were people who were the delivery man, the post office worker, the medical receptionist, the man who works with tourists, the pastor. And then once you have those nodes that are infected, they're the ones who contact 10, 20, 100 people a day. Uh, so it's very hard to start eradicating an infection once it's spread in the community and has really saturated those nodes. So just to understand why it can be so hard to get rid of uh, infections like this. Um, and let's talk a little bit about vulnerability. Um, I'd say there's been a lot of discussion saying most people will be well, try to stress that. Um, but there's definitely some people who are going to be uh, at increased risk. I would say the, the most obvious one, anytime you're a doctor taking care of patients uh, with coronavirus, is that uh, infections are more severe, largely among men. Uh, when I would look through the list of patients, usually it would be male, female, male, male, female. This would just be an entire page of M's until I get to the next page. If I'm looking at a a listing of very serious patients, very seriously ill patients. And what's interesting is that this is not just a behavioral issue. Uh, if you take mice and you expose them to SARS, uh, male mice uh, will become thicker uh, much more frequently, much more readily than female mice. But if you take out the ovaries of a female mouse, it will have the same rate of infection as a male mouse. So there's something else going on that we haven't fully identified, but there definitely is a biologic concern there. And then um, age, we've all discussed this. Um, this is from China, from the largest case series we have, where they had 79,000 total patients, 44,000 of them were confirmed. Look at those 44,000, you can see that the mortality rate in men uh, was 2.8% versus 1.7% in women, and that there's a great increase in mortality among people who are older, especially that jump of those who are over 80. That said, um, the patients that I've been seeing have largely been 40 to 50. Uh, some who are 30s, some who are even younger, uh, who are the ones who are critically ill. So it's not something that can be blase about this infection. Um, we're definitely seeing that throughout New York City, and it has not been um, kind to many 40s and 50 year olds. Uh, another thing just to think about when understanding risk is just what the demography is. Uh, China and the US have different demographies, but relatively sim similar. Um, they don't have the pyramids of a very young population that some places in the world have, which may be spared some of the um, concerns over this illness in the same way. Uh, if you look at Japan versus Nigeria, uh, Nigeria has a very young population where most people are under the age of 25. Uh, whereas in Japan, you can see it's, it's almost reversed. Uh, so if you don't have many patients who are in their 30s or over uh, in the general population relative to the total, uh, you probably do get some degree of protection from very serious illness. Um, but we don't really understand why children are doing so much better. It's actually quite fascinating, and I'll get to that in a moment. But um, in children, we actually see that um, even very young children do quite well. Initially, it was thought that children have a lot of coronavirus infections. The immunity usually lasts three years. But we see that children who are three months old do quite well. We see very young children do quite well. There will occasionally be very ill children. So it's something that is definitely a concern, but in general, there's less risk. Um, and then our other risk, one that just stands out is hypertension. Um, usually patients who develop the most severe complications of this disease have hypertension. 
Uh, we don't fully understand why at this point. There's a lot of theories, but it would just be speculation without more proof. Um, another thing to think about is just um, what kind of viral incubators do you have uh, in your community where you are? Uh, the Diamond Princess cruise was once the largest country uh, of patients uh, with coronavirus outside of China. Um, they had 712 out of 3,711 uh, who were infected and 10 who died. It's probably our best uh, epidemiologic case series. And it's probably about 23% of them, even though the median age was 65, and most of them were in their 60s, 70s, and 80s in this ship. Um, it was actually, um, there was 23% who were asymptomatic. So even those who were older can be asymptomatic and can have very mild cases. So you want to you want to not be the diamond princess. So you want to make sure that nursing homes, homeless shelters, prisons, jails, mental institutions, dormitories um, are thinned out. Uh, by whatever means appropriate, it's really important that you don't have these incubators where you just end up with this very high multiplication of the virus because then you're just going to put incredible stress on your intensive care unit all at once. Um, and again, uh, babies do well, pregnant women relatively do well. There are um, cases of pregnant women having bad uh, cases of coronavirus. So it's not something that's 100%, but in general, cases have been quite good on these populations. Um, I saw there were some questions about uh, the virus and um, whether you can become reinfected, what's going on with that. So what I wanted to explain first is that uh, the virus is usually uh, highest uh, when you first had symptoms. So you can see right on the left side of this graph, uh, the viral amounts in this graph are higher, and then they all drop off by day nine or so uh, for the most part. We do see that if you have more severe illness, that you have a higher level of virus. They use the inverse of viral load here. So just you will have a higher amount of virus on your first day of symptoms, if we could check it, uh, than someone who will have mild disease. But on day five, you will who you have severe disease will have a lower viral load than someone on day one who will have mild disease, just because they all drop very quickly, whether you have severe or mild disease. But it, it says something interesting that maybe the amount of virus that um, you are exposed to or your initial viral control, if your body just lets the virus multiply without controlling it, uh, can play a role in your later illness. Um, that said, uh, these tests aren't perfect. There are neg false negative tests. It's hard to get the swab into the back of the nose. Uh, there's also this up and down of the amount of virus. And then moreover, um, people later in illness often have negative tests. So they come into the hospital incredibly ill and their test is negative. But if we do a uh, sample from their lungs, we usually get it positive. So in this sampling, 93% uh, positive from the lungs, but only 63% from the nasal swab, which is what we use on the general population. So there definitely are people who are missed who can be false negatives um, in the community. And then um, testing positive after negative. Uh, tests. This has happened um, in China and Japan where somebody uh, had coronavirus, uh, had been positive, then had two negative tests to discharge from the hospital, they were fine, and then they go home and then they're positive again. That's not surprising. Um, viral shedding often waxes and wanes, just like in that graph where it just goes up and down. Um, and moreover, um, death and complications from infections like this, other viruses like this, often come delayed like that. Uh, so some of these people have even died and after they had been cleared and thought they were doing better. But this is because these kind of viruses create this really intense inflammatory response and can result in clotting as well. Uh, so you can have microclots, you can have also in this disease, you can have uh, cardiac damage. Um, so basically you can be at risk for having a pulmonary embolism, for having a heart attack, or just having heart failure um, from this disease later on. Uh, hopefully that's going to be in a limited window and not extend out. 
Uh, we'll have to watch though to see how patients do. Um, we can never predict everything at this point, but there is good evidence that most people create a strong serologic response, meaning they make antibodies that seem to be very good at protecting against future infection, at least in the laboratory. Uh, we'll have to continue to watch this. Uh, we know that coronaviruses usually only give you immunity after an infection for about three years. Uh, this was seen in SARS, not that we rechallenge people, but basically their blood tests after three years, their antibodies went down uh, and their immunity seemed to go down. Uh, and that's true for other coronaviruses because there are many that we get common colds. And likewise, animals, this is usually an animal virus. Your pet cat at home who had the sniffles might have had a coronavirus. That's usually what we've studied. And this is what I just want to point out is that asymptomatic infections, I think, are what has made this virus so unique. Usually respiratory viruses are not driven in their spread by asymptomatic infections. It's that person who's sneezing and getting the virus over everyone that is spreading it. There actually isn't that much sneezing in this disease. Um, there is coughing, but in its only you're only super infectious when you actually have very mild symptoms even if you go on to have severe disease you probably are not shedding much virus when you're actually incredibly ill it was those first few days when you felt fine that you were spreading the virus when you were out about um doing your shopping having contact with people and then you can actually also spread the virus before you develop any symptoms probably one to two days we've seen a few cases like that um, but then there's other people who are asymptomatic who never have an infection, never have a symptom, but we can test them just like the people on that cruise ship. Um, and they seem to be a source of um, infections to other people. Uh, there's been a lot of debate as to how many. Uh, China said one in six. Uh, South Korea said about 30 percent. And Iceland, which has had an intense amount of testing and very few cases sees that they may even have up to 50%, but they'll have to see because some of those people could be pre-symptomatic still. Um, and so there's the paper in, in science where they've done modeling and they think that probably 86% of infections were undocumented in China. Um, and that these undocumented infections, even if they're less infectious than ones that are documented and documented infections are the ones that have the obvious symptoms that are recognized by doctors that are tested and aren't the very mild cases or the asymptomatic cases. But these undocumented infections may count for most of the documented cases. They may result in the transmission that leads to that uh, documented case. Um, and we've definitely had documentation of asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic infections. Usually in the flu, you only get uh, pre-symptomatic transmission one day maybe even less before you develop symptoms. This disease has a lot more uh, shedding and infection when you just don't see it from that invisible person who seems perfectly well. Um, and so this also changes as employers uh, what you do about back to work. Uh, this will probably continue to evolve because we see that people shed virus, of course, before they become ill. So that's one of the reasons why working from home is so important and why we need to keep stressing that when we're having uh, large outbreaks like we're having in New York City. But uh, when people can go back to work, uh, when uh, we're not all telecommuting, uh, it will be important to make sure that people who had had the infection uh, don't come back when they might still be infectious. They probably are not that infectious at the tail end because even finding virus doesn't mean you have live virus that will transmit to somebody else. It could just mean that you have virus that's just shed and it's already dead and it's just the genetic material and not the whole viron, the little uh, virus that's got the every piece it needs in order to infect you. So um, right now we say that you need two negative tests, 24 hours apart, improvement in symptoms and no fever if you wanna do everything by the letter of the law. But because we just don't have the testing, uh, right now the CDC recommends uh, no fever for three days, at least seven days since the first symptom um, and that your other symptoms are resolving. Uh, and then that you wear a mask for 14 days since your initial symptom uh, if you go back to work. Um, so treatment, there's been a lot of attention towards this. And if we had a treatment that either uh, was a pre-exposure prophylaxis, meaning that before people were exposed, they could take this drug and it would prevent them from ever getting sick. That would be terrific for EMS workers, uh, for emergency room doctors, for ICU doctors, uh, nurses. 
Um, or you could take it immediately after you're exposed. Or um, you could just take it when you start to have symptoms. And this would also possibly reduce the amount of virus out in the community. Um, it's one of the ways that we've controlled HIV uh, by being able to reduce the virus by treating it. So we hope to find treatments. Um, there's been a lot of theories, uh, a lot of back and forth, a lot of um, thoughts on this, but we don't have an answer and no one has an answer right now. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about one drug. Uh, this is Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine, which is very similar to chloroquine. Plaquenil is a drug we use for lupus and other autoimmune disorders. Uh, and chloroquine is a medication we use for malaria. Uh, also, azithromycin was used in the study along with the Plaquenil, which is the hydrocarbon hydroxychloroquine. And you can see that uh, the control, and what I want to stress is the control is not randomized. This was uh, open label. The doctors in the study knew which person was getting which drug, which can always influence how you make decisions, whether you're conscious of it or not. Um, and then the uh, line in blue is um, hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil. Uh, there's a decrease in the amount of virus uh, that's being shed in those patients, and then even lower with the zithromycin and the Plaquenil. Some people think that zithromycin may be an antiviral as well. The problem is looking back on this study, there uh, had been 26 patients enrolled on the medication. Uh, six of them were not included in the final analysis, and five of them had very bad outcomes, uh, which does shift these results. Um, and so just how the data has been arranged and how it's been um, fully presented uh, has raised some questions as to whether uh, this will turn out in a randomized control trial uh, to actually be effective. We would all love it to be effective. Uh, and there are randomized control trials going on uh, that are starting up. There's one that's for any healthcare worker right now at the University of Minnesota, but there's other ones at um, hospitals around the country. So we hopefully will have an answer on that. And if we can decrease viral load, uh, we can decrease infection and start ending this epidemic. Uh, there have been a lot of hope for an HIV drug called lopinavir ritonavir, which is Kaletra. Um, you can see there's a trend towards the Kaletra, the red line, the lopinavir ritonavir uh, improving, but it's not significant. A lot of people believe that the medication had been given earlier in the course and not towards the end when the person already had the virus mostly out of their system, that it might have been better. But we really have no proof that Kaletra could work. It's still being used in many hospitals because there have been some interesting data on other coronaviruses and animal studies. Um, but still, we don't know uh, that it will work. Uh, there's other drugs that are working on a different side. So these drugs, as well as remdesivir, which is a Gilead drug that's getting a lot of attention too. Um, these three drugs, there's also drugs that aren't just looking at the virus and decreasing that, but trying to stop this immunologic storm that's created. Uh, most people just control the virus, the virus goes away, and they feel maybe a little tired, but they're better afterwards. That 15%, and then that, especially that 3% that have really critical illness, they have this just immunologic storm that goes on. And we don't know who's going to have that. We've had patients who have terrible lung disease, who have asthma, who have every reason why you think that they would have a bad outcome with a pulmonary disease, who do great. We have other patients who are in their 30s who've never had a medical problem in their life, who have terrible immunologic response. It's just this overly robust response. Uh, so the hope is that if there's some way that we can decrease this immune response, give inhibitors to the particular parts of the immune response, particularly IL-6, uh, that might work. Um, then there's been a lot of questions raised about uh, ibuprofen and Aleve, these are called NSAIDs, uh, and also about different hypertensive meds. Um, this is really just about the receptors that are used uh, biologically by this virus, and these drugs could impact those receptors, but without actual data and just a theoretical concern, we really can't say. The Minister of Health for France said don't take ibuprofen, but everyone else has kind of stepped back from that now. We'll just have to see where the data goes. And talking about treatments, I want to explain that the most important treatment is really oxygen. Um, around the world, this is how oxygen comes. In a hospital in the U.S., it comes in a huge concentrator, probably in the basement, and then it's 
uh, distributed throughout the hospital and you just plug into a wall almost like you would plug in uh, your iPhone to plug in and charge. You can do the same thing and just plug in and get oxygen. But we're looking at trying to expand capacity. Uh, Javits Convention Center in New York City will probably become a clinic um, and a hospital, in fact. Uh, and so oxygen will be something that we'll really need. And the logistics of actually using these tanks can be quite complicated. Uh, when you have many patients and you just have a large number, one of these tanks, if you're on a minimal amount of oxygen, lasts you a day. But if you're on a lot of oxygen, you might need four or six of these tanks a day. And if you have hundreds or thousands of patients, these tanks, which are well over 100 pounds, um, it just makes it uh, adds more complexity and something that US hospitals are not used to. Um, likewise, there's also CPAP, uh, non-invasive ventilation. A lot of people use this to sleep. This can also help people um, as a sort of treatment to get them through. Um, but just to point out, um, there's a lot of talk on using ventilators where you use split it into four. Uh, you can home make um, uh, with kind of 3D printing different vents uh, or ventilators. It's important to realize that this is a very difficult disease to manage. Uh, this isn't just like intubating someone um, when they have surgery and just waking them up at the end. Uh, ARDS, which is the uh, severe outcome of this disease, is actually just quite difficult to manage and we're not very good at it. Um, in severe ARDS at baseline from any cause, it can be from a pneumonia, an infection, it can be from trauma, car accident, just something that causes inflammatory response in your lungs. Um, it's a 46% mortality, even when everything is done right. Um, but it's often between 20 to 50% in all comers. Uh, we have to be very specific on how we use the vent, uh, exactly what volume we push into the lungs, uh, what our rate is, all of the measurements, the fine tuning has to be very precise. Uh, this is not something where you can just wing it and just make sure the patient is getting some oxygen um, or the mortality rate will be even higher. Um, and then there's another uh, mechanism of uh, modality here is ECMO, uh, which is um, basically a heart-lung bypass while the lungs are healing. Uh, it's incredibly complicated to use and the outcomes are quite poor in most people. Usually if you've reached the point where you need ECMO, you've had terrible damage to your lungs and it's just not looking good. Uh, and that's for any case. Um, but uh, it's something that's a very limited resource and I just wanted to share that. Um, there are countries that only have a little over a dozen of these machines. Um, the US clearly has many more, but it's something that if we will definitely um, not have the ECMO capacity for every young person who has this disease. Um, so another thing I just want to talk about was surfaces and um, infection with that. Um, so the main thing that comes up is packages and workspaces. So with packages, uh, the real risk is that person behind the box. Most transmission will not be from objects that have been contaminated. We call those fomites. Um, it will be from the person who still has it in their lungs, who might be asymptomatic, have no symptoms, have a mild case, is still working, not realizing this. Uh, and so that's where you're usually going to get the infection from. But we want to be careful. Um, and the question always comes up, should you be wiping down packages or surfaces? And so what we can look at is um, the half-life of the virus on different um, steel or plastic. The half-life is around seven hours on plastic. The red is COVID. Uh, the blue is uh, the original SARS. It's about almost six hours on stainless steel. On copper, it's only about one hour. But on cardboard, it's around four hours. Um, and you can see that on all these, the, the amount of virus um, dropped pretty quickly. And so if you look at cardboard, um, usually the half-life by, by four hours, half of the virus will be gone. Um, and then by the time you've reached one day, almost all the virus has been gone. So if you're receiving packages that are taking three days in the mail, uh, that's not that much of a concern. Uh, if you have a courier who's bringing it over in an hour and the other person might be infected, uh, then open up the package and throw out the outer if it's the delivery person that's a concern, but maybe the person who put the initial item in the uh, carrying um, in the package 
uh, might have been the source of infection. It's still quite unlikely, um, but if you ever were particularly concerned and it was something that was sent over immediately, um, any kind of bleach Lysol um, will definitely can work on decontaminating. But in general, that's just not a risk. And usually in a few hours, the virus is gone. Um, and also it's not that infectious if it's at a low number. Uh, so just very low amounts of virus on a, on a surface. It's just not how it's gonna be spread. It's gonna be spread by someone who just touched a surface and then you touched it. It's usually not gonna be um, that little amount that's left over a few hours later. Um, and so talking about where we are, I feel like I should talk more about what we don't have. Um, I think there's a lot of discussion about why uh, ICUs and ventilators are sort of the common good that we're all sharing uh, right now. And it's a, something that we, we all need to be able to rely on. Uh, many rural areas in the US have very little surge capacity in terms of intensive care units. Uh, there's lots of people who've gone out somewhere rural to kind of ride out this storm, but they've gone to communities that only have one ICU bed. Um, so that would be quite concerning if there's a surge of cases, even if the town is small and there's only a few thousand people in the town. Um, this is for New York State based on a model by Imperial College in London. That's my old research group, uh, where I did my PhD. Um, and I think that they really thought through uh, different scenarios. Um, but to explain it, they basically say, if you don't do anything, you don't even try to reduce your contacts and everyone just goes about mixing as much as they would have before, then you might have ended up needing at your peak uh, 50,000 ventilators in New York State. Uh, New York State has 3,000 um, ICU beds and usually 600 free because obviously they're used for other things. Uh, so that would have been a tremendous problem. Clearly we had done some measures and it will have some impact. Uh, this impact won't be felt until two weeks after any measures that were taken. So um, the, the minimal amount, if we did almost everything to uh, of these like non-pharmaceutical interventions to reduce contacts, to reduce, reduce transmission, to reduce that are not that I was describing the number of cases one case will produce, then uh, New York State at its peak would still need 6,000 beds. Um, 6,000 ventilators, which is clearly above their baseline of 3,000 with 600 for free. So it's still a, quite an issue. Um, and hopefully we're dealing with a picture that's closer to the 6,000 than the 50,000, but still the estimates right now are still around 30,000 for New York State. Uh, New York State has a population of 20 million. Um, and another thing to think about and things we don't have yet, we don't fully know, um, everything about transmission. We know that droplet is the far and away the biggest cause. Someone standing within three feet of you uh, infects you or you're the anesthesiologist who intubates someone and you have your face right into their face and then you have aerosolization, these tiny little fragments of the virus that can survive in the air for, for a few hours, in fact. That's a rare event. It has to be that you've been intubating someone or something similar to that. Um, but we understand that actually um, so we only need surgical masks for the three feet, and we need the N95s for these aerosolization events. Uh, these N95 respirators are harder to find, and that's been a real issue. Um, but just that sometimes there's a continuum and not perfectly a dichotomy between droplet and airborne. Um, these are in some ways kind of the black swan events of transmission, but they were seen in the original SARS, just rare cases where it might be a medical student just stood outside a room and still was infected, even though they shouldn't have been. Um, so it's just something that we have to continue to watch for and make sure that we're eliminating any infection we can. Um, right now, 8% of infections in Italy are among healthcare workers, and it's going to be healthcare workers who are most likely to have these infections. But the real reason that healthcare workers are being infected is simply they don't have the basics of the PPE they need. Uh, the N95s, those are those three different types of masks. Above, there's a bunch of different types of N95s or respirators. Um, surgical mask, which you need to prevent droplets, is the most common to use. Uh, it also can prevent infection from spreading from someone. And then uh, some kind of eye protection. A lot of people forget that this virus can actually spread on mucous membranes. Uh, so it's really important that all health providers have um, goggles on. We've actually known for years that people who wear glasses are actually less 
uh, likely to get flu in the hospital um, because of the protection even simple glasses provide. And then we also really need to know how we can safely conserve PPE. Uh, the U.S. has always had extra resources for healthcare. We haven't in our lifetime met surge capacity. It's really just those of us who work abroad and work in resource limited countries that are used to having to think through how do you conserve PPE. So there's been a whole kind of maker movement to, to sew your own mask. The problem is the filtration of cloth is just not the same as the specific filters in even a simple mask, but especially in these PPE N95 masks. And so these kind of hand sewn masks are just not the same. The, the small little mite vir virons, the little viruses can get through the weave of cotton. Um, and then some of these other filters that are offered uh, may also, um, if they have uh, any kind of glass particles in them and different people are using all sorts of strange things as filters could also cause damage. So we really need to figure out what we can use um, to replace PPE how long we can reuse PPE. Uh, right now, uh, a lot of hospitals are just having someone use a mask every day, maybe day in and day out with the same one. These are masks that uh, their approval was just for one time use. And now we're using them for 50 times and maybe more. Uh, they do degrade over time. And so just understanding what works best. Um, we need a lot more information on what works for decontamination. Uh, and that will help um, office spaces. We know that these UVGI, the special UVC lights, which take a particular type of UV from the sun, uh, can sterilize items. So it's something that we use in hospitals in some cases, um, but you shouldn't put your hand under it. That would obviously not be a good idea. Um, and then there's also different types of decontamination. Um, but uh, washing um, these PPE with alcohol or bleach will destroy the weave that protects uh, the wearer. So it's not actually helpful. Um, also just negative pressure rooms, different ways to try to change the air and then change the amount of exposure uh, uh, healthcare workers are having. And then there's just a lot of supply chain issues in hospitals right now. Um, we don't have the tests, not just because we don't have the tests, but because we don't have the PPE to run the tests. We don't have the swabs, we don't have the reagents, but also, Everyone has asked for an inhaler um, prescription. So we don't have inhalers. We don't have all the antibiotics we usually have. Um, and then uh, what we also need to know is what serology is. That means antibodies. So who is immune to this? Who has already uh, been infected? Um, how long uh, does this immunity last? How long does the infection last? When do you develop your immunity? When are you safe? And then how many people had asymptomatic infections? Um, and then we'll probably end up uh, with a lot more drug resistance. We also need a lot more telemedicine that will really offload uh, clinics. A lot of clinics have been learning this fast, like everyone's been learning Zoom fast. Um, and then we just need a lot more testing. We just don't have the capacity to test even hospitalized patients always in New York. Uh, we just don't have all the reagents and everything we need. Um, and then the other thing is we kind of need a crystal ball to be able to do this because we're always responding to the outbreak that was one week or two weeks ago because uh, patients are exposed and then five, eight days later, they develop symptoms. And then five, eight days later after that, they come in for, um, for more severe symptoms. So we sometimes are just two weeks behind the ball. Um, all these infections actually happened two weeks ago. Um, and then another thing is just the amount of stress uh, this will create on the healthcare system. Um, this is very true. Um, doctors and nurses right now are writing their wills. Uh, this has been uh, the amount of challenges there are in having safe ways to take care of patients. It's tremendous right now. And it's beyond anything I've ever seen before. And I worked in Ebola units. I ran Ebola units. The amount of stress that doctors and nurses are under right now because of the exposure risks they have is greater than what I was seeing um, in hospitals running Ebola units. Um, and this is an Ebola unit that listed all of the workers who died uh, in Kenema and Sierra Leone. And there's been a long history of epidemics with uh, here's Dr. Khan um, from Ebola, Dr. Bani um, from SARS. Many people know Dr. Li Wang Lang, uh, Dr. Natali, who was an Italian doctor who said, 
uh, that they did not have enough PPE but continued to work. Um, so these people all raised the alarm in their own countries and there was a really slow response to understanding how important it is to deal with an epidemic head on and, and all of these people died um, from the disease that they were trying to warn everyone about. Um, and we're already seeing healthcare workers die in the US which will just have a tremendous impact on the morale in healthcare uh, settings and the ability to care for other illnesses as well. Um, so just quickly, um, what did we learn from 1918? Uh, this is why we're doing all of these uh, social distancing because they were right in 1918. Uh, they had worked with quarantines in the past. They knew that this worked. Um, it's kind of interesting to see how much of the peak is all at the same time between New York, London, Paris, and Berlin. But the thing to also note on that is you can kind of tell that there were actually three waves. There was that first wave and then uh, then a second wave in the fall, and then a third wave the following year. Um, that's our concern here. Coronaviruses usually cycle. Uh, they're usually in the winter and then less in the summer. It's not just because of temperature. That's actually, um, some of it is actually just that schools are out, there's less mixing, and that's kind of one of the big impacts. Um, we've probably all seen this flatten the curve graph um, where we saw Philadelphia had a parade where St. Louis, uh, work on social distancing, it's kind of in the moral of the story here. But I think another moral story is actually this paper that just came out yesterday. Um, it's something that we've seen in epidemics in general. Um, pandemics depress the economy, but it's not really the public health interventions that are doing that, even though they're obviously what's the direct uh, immediate cause of these changes in the economy. But they looked back on um, employment and manufacturing in various cities throughout the US, and they looked at the total numbers of days that they used social distancing, and cities that had social distancing for longer and hence less severe, less painful outbreaks actually responded better um, in the coming years um, and had a greater growth in their economy, in their employment, and their manufacturing. It's actually kind of an interesting paper just to kind of uh, look at. And we've definitely seen places that respond very late to epidemics often just are devastated by these epidemics. Um, so how do we get out of this? Um, one, uh, I would love that summer just erased all of this, that better weather, it's getting warmer in New York City, um, but we can see that uh, local transmission occurs at all these different temperatures, the purple dots are the local transmission. The mean temperature is up to around 30 degrees. Singapore had transmission um, at 30 degrees Celsius, i.e. quite hot. You can have transmission in the 90 degree Fahrenheit, 100 degree Fahrenheit, um, and then all the way down to, to freezing temperatures. Um, and likewise with humidity, you can have um, transmission at different levels of humidity. This virus actually likes dry uh, air better to transmit itself in. And so fundamentally, the answer is going to be um, we obviously can't stay in quarantine. We can't stay with social distancing forever. Uh, but um, we're going to just need testing, testing, testing that we've always needed uh, with expansive contact tracing. But we can't do it right now in cities like New York where we just don't have enough tests or enough resources. But once we get ahead of the curve, that's going to be the way we track down cases and then finally start to get down to zero, uh, which is going to take a while. Um, this will help that some people will be immune. Uh, acquired immunity helps. And that's the reason why cycles happen also. You have to have a certain number of people who are immune so they don't just have continued spread. Um, and that can kind of be the dampening effect when you have those waves every year of certain viruses. Um, and then it's gonna need to be coupled with kind of a, a staggered um, opening and uh, loosening of, of social distancing with constant vigilance for reintroduction. Uh, there's a reason why China is closing their borders, so to speak, right now. Uh, they are at risk of having it reintroduced and ending up with the same problem again. Um, and also, we need to be really protective of uh, health facilities where there will be continued to be uh, these transmission events to healthcare workers. Sometimes it's because it's asymptomatic infection, sometimes even in their coworker, sometimes it's atypical infections where they just had their guard down. But sometimes it's just they were everything, they did everything right, and they still got infected um, because uh, these aren't uh, bulletproof vests that protect us from any virus. And then finally, the way we really get out of this is a vaccine. The problem is that will probably take 18 months. If we're really lucky, it would take a year, uh, but 
just to be able to test, to be able to be um, able to um, uh, be able to create enough of the uh, vaccine to distribute it. It takes us six months to create the flu vaccine every year, and we've been doing that for decades. Um, just the mass production and everything involved in this. After we find a vaccine that works, um, will be um, a great challenge. Uh, we haven't yet found a vaccine that worked for MERS or for SARS. There were some candidates, and that's what we're using now in the trials that are just starting. And then I just want to say, this will not be the last one. Um, it's This is not a surprise to people who work in infectious disease that this pandemic happened. It was known that there were SARS-like uh, viruses in bats that had every reason to expect that one day they would just be unlucky and cross over to a person. Um, sometimes it's indirect. Uh, there's another virus in the movie Contagion, if you've ever seen that movie. That virus, Nipah virus, spread because um, bats ate fruit that fell down into pig farms. Um, and then the pigs had the infection and they spread it to uh, pig workers, uh, pig farmers in Malaysia. Not what you'd expect, um, but it just can be strange series of events that result in the spread of a virus from bats. And it's just bats again and again. Uh, it can be other animals as well. Pigs are often involved. Ducks are often involved in flu, um, but uh, bats are just particularly, they have a very unusual immune system. Uh, they're also a lot colder than we are. They have a lot of kind of differences where they're fine with rabies, whereas rabies will kill all of us. Um, and then there'll be a lot of times that uh, people will think that there's no chance that this will ever cause a problem, but of course it will. Um, this was thought about Ebola for years. And then the, the last thing I would say is that just like um, we have problems of uh, global warming um, because of industrial advances, um, we have um, changes in our political uh, spheres based on uh, changes in the internet and there's also um, a, a real change in the amount of viruses that the human population is being exposed to, and then that can be disseminated. It's not just that you can fly from London to Johannesburg, it's that you can go from, this is Lofa County, Liberia, or you can go from Kenema, Sierra Leone, um, it, roads used to be like this, the counter bullet right by each other, the, the roads used to be like this, there used to be Ebola that would happen in historically in towns every once in a while uh, after exposure to a bat, but didn't spread because the virus couldn't travel very far if the roads were like this. But there's been a massive investment in extractive industries uh, throughout Africa, particularly, but also China has had a, a massive um, urbanization, a movement from just being rural. Um, and this has really resulted in the connection to animals in these uh, far reaches of uh, our environment. Um, and then the travel, um, I could travel from this town in Sierra Leone to Europe um, in about eight to 10 hours. Uh, the road to the hospital where the outbreak of Ebola uh, first started was only six months old when the outbreak started. Uh, and that's the road that Ebola traveled down. Uh, so we were really at risk for having more of these pandemics and everyone who works in the field of infectious diseases um, really does imagine that there'll be more. They might be influenza, they might be Nipah, they might be, um, they might be bird flu and it might be another coronavirus. We also will continue to see the current coronavirus um, as it, it comes back because we won't have 100% immunity, not everyone will be infected, and there'll be a continued risk for our uh, health facilities um, in the coming year um, until we're able to get a vaccine. Um, and that's really it. Um, I hope I can answer any questions, um, and I hope I was able to share some information that helps. That's all we have time for today. Thanks again to Dr. Megan Coffey, Clinical Assistant Professor in the Department of Medicine at NYU Langone, reporting live to you from New York City. Please stay safe and be well during this difficult time. We are all in your debt. If you still have questions that we didn't cover, give us a call at 866-542-3744. A recording of this and all our other webinars is posted on the DRI website. 
This webinar has been a production of DRI International 2020, all rights reserved. Thank you for your attention.